What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE, fantasy football. We're talking rookies today because the NFL draft has come and it's left us in the past, like every girl in my life. That's how we're going to start this episode off today. Okay, we're talking about the top five rookies, my favorite rookies post NFL draft for your 2020 fantasy football team this is not dynasty centric if you got your rookie draft coming up don't worry we got plenty of good content coming out with the bunk bed breakdown boys tomorrow and throughout the rest of the week this is redraft focus of course a lot of the info is going to be relevant to how you draft and the players that are picked in the draft and etc 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 but today we're talking about my favorite rookies that will actually make an impact in 2020 fantasy football let's talk about rookies in general okay because i think this is worth noting especially in a time like this when we're all fucking starving and uh, anemic when it comes to sports content in general the only thing us football fans have had to look forward to is this draft right we've been harping on these rookies even if you don't play dynasty i bet you you've dove into the rookie class a little bit more this year than you ever have just because you've been bored you've been looking for content to consume and there's a lot more dynasty and rookie content out there in general here's the thing when you take so much time looking at these individual players you start to get a certain affinity towards them the problem with that is most rookies don't pan out and we look at these guys for three or four months at a time we get so excited about them we think that they're going to be more than they are and this is not for like the top end elite guys this is just in a general sense so when we're drafting in in regular drafts you don't want to be throwing dart shots at all these rookies at the end of drafts because for the most part they won't produce. That is especially true when we talk about draft capital, y'all. The later a rookie gets picked in the actual NFL draft, the further and further and further away you should stay from them. I don't care how talented you thought a dude was in college. He ends up as a fifth round pick, a sixth round pick, a seventh round pick. He needs to be off your radar because I know you're listening and you love this one guy, but guess what? This other guy loves another guy and only 5% of those fifth round rookie running backs are going to have a top 24 season in their career. And I pulled up this chart from Mr. Mr. Uh, Peter Howard, his Twitter handle is at P-A Howdy, P-A-H-O-W-D-Y. And basically he put together since 2003, he looked at running backs drafted, right? And if you see in that middle column RB count, so there have been 35 first round running backs, 38 second round running backs, y'all get the gist, uh, since 2003. And what he looked at was the percentage of those running backs and how many top five seasons they had, how many top 12 seasons they had. You can see on the left, the orange side is just the overall count of a uh, number of top five, top 12, top 24 seasons and the percentage on the other side. So basically what you're saying here is if you look at the first row, right? Draft round one. So we look at 35 first round running backs drafted out of those 34.3% of them have at least one top five season. That seems like a pretty good hit rate, but that also means that a guy like Saquon Barkley, who was picked in the first round, if he has three top five seasons over his career, that boosts up the percentages of all these other guys. And as you can see, obviously like the percentage gets higher as you give it a little more leverage there, like top 12 finishes is up to 63% and you know, 94 0.3% of the running backs picked in the first round have at least a top 36 finish in their career. Percentages dramatically drop off. And the biggest change you could see is that third to fourth round gap. That third to fourth round gap is enormous. Second round running backs are doing pretty well. You can expect a pretty good hit rate on those guys. As soon as it drops from third to fourth round, you're looking at the absolute fantasy dead zone. So just keep that in mind with the future, guys. You have to understand that as much as you like a player or as much as you think a guy is talented or whatever the fuck you think about a player is, the honest truth is in the percentages. The numbers don't lie. Y'all lie. I lie a lot of the time, actually, but I try not to lie when I'm talking to you guys. The numbers, however do not lie there. The percentage chance of fourth rounders, fifth rounders, sixth rounders really busting out are very, 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 very low. And those are usually skewed by one or two guys that break out and do really well for a really long period of time. So that is the segue that I wanted to start off this video with. We're going to talk a lot about running backs, which is why I brought that chart out, because those are the ones that typically have the biggest impact in year one. That being said, stop yelling. I'll stop yelling. Tuck your shirts in. Let's eat. Okay, 
So let's start off with uh, the shot heard around the world, the pick heard around the world. The first round was a little bit underwhelming just in terms of the amount of hype that came out on Twitter and all the trades that we thought were going to happen and all the craziness that was going to happen. None of the craziness really happened, except for pick 32 by the Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs went out and said, fuck it. We're the Super Bowl champs. What piece do we need to make sure that we can repeat, to stay as explosive as we possibly can, to stay as versatile as we possibly can? Who do we want? They chose Clyde Edwards Hilaire, the running back out of the national champion team, LSU. You know, we had been talking about for the last few months, how badly we wanted one of these rookie running backs to land in KC. I mean, not even like we didn't even expect the first round draft capital out of it. We I don't even know if I expected a second, but I was praying that someone fell in the third, right? Because that chart I showed you, like basically if you ain't a third round pick or before, if you're not a day one or day two pick, your percentage chance of, you know, getting on the field or being a workhorse or whatever it is dramatically dip off. So the fact that they use first round capital, 32nd overall pick as the first running back off the board should speak volumes. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that a lot of people look at Clyde Edwards Hilaire and they think that he's not that that good of a running back. They think that he is a guy that produced because of this LSU offense and he's a product of the system and not the other way around. And I think they're going to think the same thing with KC. There's a reason Joe Burrow said that Clyde Edwards Hilaire was the best football player he's ever played with. And remember, he transferred from Alabama to LSU. He's played with a lot of talented players before. He said that. When they texted Pat Mahomes, they said, what player do you want? They literally texted him and they said, name one player. Don't think about it. Who is it? He said, Clyde. I don't want to dip too deep into like who they are as prospects per se. I want to talk about more so their situation for 2020 and you know fantasy football in general. I did a video uh, about a month or two ago, my top five rookie running backs as prospects. So if you missed that one, I'll link it up there and, and down below in the description or whatever. That dove into like who they were as college players a little bit more. Now, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, you could probably look at him as as a little bit of a smaller prospect weighing in at 207 pounds 5'7 in height you're looking at a guy that's definitely short in stature and is not developed like a Jonathan Taylor in terms of like the workhorse size that you want to see but the BMI at 89th percentile tells you that he's he's thick right he's not lean he's not someone who's going to take hits and end up getting hurt a lot so I, I will dive into the numbers but I, I also want to say like I don't I don't think we need to make this that much harder than it needs to be right like he was the first running back off the board when Brett Veach told Andy Reid Go watch some tape from Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Let me know what you think. You will see some Brian Westbrook in his game. Reed watched, went back to Veach and said, he's better than Brian Westbrook. So Andy Reed saw this, compared him to Brian Westbrook, said he was better, and then used their first round draft capital on this guy. So what makes this pick so intriguing? What makes a landing spot so intriguing? You're playing behind Patrick Mahomes. What that means is your offense is about to score a shit ton of points. I went back and looked at this. Since Patrick Mahomes has taken over, in the games that he has started, which include the playoffs as well, Kansas City running backs have averaged 1.76 touchdowns per game. Nearly two touchdowns per game the Kansas City running backs have averaged when Mahomes is the starting quarterback. That is by far and away the highest number in the NFL right now. Is CH going to get all of those touchdowns? Of course not, right? They are still going to utilize other running backs. Other guys are going to eat and get into the end zone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as the first round pick, they're going to throw him right into the game and he is going to be a near every down player there. So if that number splits in half, right? If 1.75, you give him half the touchdowns there, 0.85 per game, stretch that out over 16 games, you're still looking at a double digit touchdown floor and you want to talk about being able to use him in all assets of the game like there's a reason why they compare him to brian westbrook because he is so shifty you can't tackle him in the backfield whether it's a spin move whether it's him juking from fucking on this side of the wall to that side of the wall very shifty very hard to bring down especially in the open field which is why he works out beautifully in this offense because they will design so many screens and so many plays and so many dump offs to a guy like clyde edward Teller who went nuts in college in the passing game. 55 receptions his final year in college. Max Borgi, the next coming of Christian McCaffrey, supposedly, was the only running back in the country that had more receptions than him. As a route runner, he's as good as anyone. Graham Barfield, who's, whose opinion I respect very much, he does the yards created column, which is a fantastic read. I, I suggest any of you guys just go uh, Google that, Graham Barfield, yards created. He came away and said CH was the absolute best route runner that we've seen enter the draft from the running back position since a guy like Christian McCaffrey. LSU lined him up as a wide receiver on a class high 26% of his 
routes last year. And as a runner, Graham sat at him out causing the single most missed tackles forced per rush attempt. This guy is a, a the, the point I'm trying to get across is he's not just a he's not just a running back in KC. He's actually a very very good running back and happens to have the first round draft capital now. This guy is going to catch 60 passes in all 5 years of his rookie contract, I would bet. We talk about Brian Westbrook comparisons. Westbrook had legitimately under Andy Reid, Westbrook had a 5-year stretch where he was averaging over 7 targets a game. This is not one year where he averaged over 7 targets a game. You take the 5 years O four to 08, he was averaging over seven targets a game at the running back position. And I heard a stat on, uh, I think it was the Roto Underworld podcast from Nate List that Andy Reid has had, I mean, this is, you know, we want to talk about like coaching or whatever, but Andy Reid has always produced dynamite fantasy running backs. If one can stay healthy, that is the biggest problem. I feel like the only years where you don't really see a blow up from the fantasy backfield in KC is one where like someone gets hurt and then they just start rotating and carouseling guys who keep getting fucking sprained ankles and sprained knees and shit. If that doesn't happen though, whoever's a running back one always dominates. And there have been five Five separate occasions, five separate occasions under Andy Reid where a running back has seen over 100 targets. I would put I would put big money that at some point in Clyde Edwards Hilaire's rookie contract, if not multiple times, he will see 90 plus or 100 plus targets. He is going to be he's going to be such a high floor play just from the reception game. So the, the point here is, is Clyde is much more than just a running back that happened to land in KC. Clyde is a very good running back. He is very good at creating on his own. He's very good in the passing game. And now he is in a situation where the running backs score a ridiculous amount of points. They get a ridiculous number of targets. In any sort of PPR league, he is the running back one in redraft. If you want to argue Taylor versus CEH, who we'll get into in a second, in Dynasty, completely up to the The two are in a tier by themselves, for sure. In redraft, CEH is the most likely to get in there and affect the offense and get an involvement in the passing game and by the goal line right off the rip. So Clyde Edwards Hilaire, definitely the first running back off of my board. And I'm actually going to, I'm going to hop over to this site, fantasymojo.com, which shows you draft of high stakes players, FFPC draft. So I want to see since the draft has ended where players are getting picked right now. We have one live online draft. I'll jump into some best ball drafts after this. This is a redraft league. We had Jonathan Taylor go off the board at the 210. And we had Clyde Edwards Hilaire go off the board at the 211. Just to give you an idea for where these guys are going, FFPC are full PPR. So I definitely would not be taking Taylor at the 210. And I would absolutely be taking Clyde over over Taylor. That's probably where these things are going to settle. I think that uh, Clyde will likely be somewhere go going in the second round. I mean, people are just going to hype him and hype him and hype him and hype him until he gets to that mid to second round range. Obviously, you'd be much more comfortable with him if you could take him in the third round. The early third round would be fantastic. I'll probably get my hands on him in a couple leagues uh, at the end of the second round. If he does start moving up to the, the back end of the first round or early second round, I'll probably look elsewhere. Like I would probably rather a guy like Josh Jacobs than Clyde Edwards Hilaire. And I think that might be like a, re a reasonable argument this, this summer. I'll pull up a couple other best ball. All right. So we had one that started yesterday. Clyde Edwards Hilaire went off the board at 204. Again, this is full PPR, so that makes a little bit more sense. Taylor has not been picked. They're up to the 211 pick right now. We had one that started on April 25th, which was the Saturday. So we'd already had the first and second round in the bag. Clyde Edwards Hilaire dropped to the 304. Jonathan Taylor to the 308. I hope that those values stay. I would love to get Clyde as my RB2 in the third round. That'd be fantastic. You'll probably have to pull the trigger a lot earlier. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more analysis that goes into it over the course of the summer and just hearing a reports about what they're doing and whatnot. All right. All right. I've talked about Jonathan Taylor a lot and he is the next running back. I think that we should cover because he will definitely be impactful in his rookie year. I mean, Jonathan Taylor and Quentin Nelson as the most beautiful pairing of things I've heard since my bar tab and 32 margaritas. You know, after day one, from a dynasty standpoint, I'm like, there's no way anyone can usurp Clyde Edwards Hilaire as the 101. And then Jonathan Taylor lands in Indy. And I'm thinking now I got to I'm thinking I got to think about it now. Put on the think hat, still go with Clyde, but it's it's much closer. And I, I see them two in a tier together. Now, we know Indy's been building this offensive line to be a powerhouse in the league for the last few years, anchored by Quentin Nelson, of course. They were the second highest rated run blocking line in the league per PFF last year. And they ran the ball at a clip of 46%, which was the fifth highest rate in the NFL. So you know what they want to do. They want to run the damn ball. So when we look at Taylor strictly from a 2020 fantasy football standpoint, again, guys, don't be fucking arguing in the comments comments about how Taylor needs to be drafted over CEH and Dynasty. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about redraft. There are two concerns when we talk about Taylor in 2020 fantasy football. It's what happens with Marlon Mack? Does Taylor come in and just make Mack completely irrelevant? And what happens in the passing game? Does he get any work in the passing game, which is a huge question mark when we're talking about most people playing half PPR or full PPR leagues? And this could be a problem for Taylor. So let's start with the latter. And I believe this is the reason why some teams passed on Taylor, right? 
here, it, like we we hear we're hearing all this analysis come out now about how fucking Jonathan Taylor is the next great coming of, of Jesus and how he's a unicorn running back in X Y Z. Thirty two teams passed on him, and then another nine teams passed on him in the second round, including the Indianapolis Colts already once. So look at it this way: if he's the next Saquon Barkley, which people are like comparing him to, or Ezekiel Elliott, right? Those guys are truly, truly like once every five year prospects and they get picked in the top five of drafts, right? Of real NFL drafts. Imagine Saquon dropping to pick 41. Like the NFL would fucking riot. It would never happen. Zeke went off the board fourth overall. When you're comparing the two and there's such a disconnect between how Twitter fucking values a player and how the NFL values a player, there is a disconnect there and there's a reason why. And I think it's because a lot of teams look at Jonathan Taylor and don't see him as that much of a versatile back. They probably see him as someone who will be an elite runner on downs one and two, really good by the goal line, but can't count on to be a full three down workhorse, at least not right out of the gate. Because when you look at it, I mean, his rushing numbers are absolutely elite. Again, I'm not going to get into like who he was as a prospect, but if you're just, just tuning into fantasy and you don't really know who Jonathan Taylor was, running back from Wisconsin, Second round pick for the Colts, 41st overall, absolutely dynamite. All three years at Wisconsin went over 2,000 yards from scrimmage, 1977, 2,194, 2003. Those were his rushing totals at the three seasons in Wisconsin. Now, 8, 8, 26. Those were his reception totals at Wisconsin. And he definitely put people, including myself, at ease a little bit with that 26 catch season, but he did also drop eight passes on 50 targets. Eight passes on 50 targets, an extremely fucking high total. That's 16% of the targets thrown your way dropped. He also has some fumbling issues. Uh, I'm not going to get into because I don't think that's going to impact him fantasy-wise at all. We talk about him in the receiving game. He's fine. He's explosive. Like He's very capable of a back, but he has some drops issues, and we don't know if teams view him as someone they're going to use on third down. Right? They already have Naeem Hines as like a pass-catching specialist. Do they get him more involved, and do they start taking Naeem Hines and Marlon Mack off the field for Jonathan Taylor? What is certainly a positive overall for the, for the running backs in Indy is the the fact that Philip Rivers is going to be the quarterback. And I expect the Colts to take a very, very similar approach to the Saints, right? They got this geriatric quarterback. They want to keep him upright. They want to keep him on the field. They have a very good offensive line, so they're going to block well. They're going to run the ball a lot, quick hitting passes so they can get the ball out of his hands quickly so he doesn't get knocked down and hurt. They're going to use a lot of dump offs to running backs to get the ball out quickly. So that's definitely a positive overall. The total running back targets to the Colts backfield over the last couple of years has been fucking anemic, right? Marlon Mack had 14 receptions in 14 games last year. One reception per game. Naeem Hines, who's the pass catching specialist, saw 58 targets, caught 44 balls, which ranked 16th among running backs, which is which is not bad. But most of that, that production came in the two games that Marlon Mack was off the field. So that's not typically their game plan unless their grinder is off the field. With Brissett gone, right, these mobile quarterbacks do not target their running backs a lot because it's just a, just think about it from a common sense standpoint. If you're if you've been a really athletic quarterback your entire life and you're a running quarterback and you're mobile, when you're under pressure, your first instinct is going to be tuck it and run. Let me make a move. Let me make a guy miss and get some yards for my team. If you are a Phillip Rivers type who can't fucking move below his waist, you're looking to dump off right away. You get under pressure. Who's the closest guy to you? Dump it, dump it, dump it. So there will be, and this is just, you know, Lamar Jackson does not throw to his quarterbacks. Tennessee had one of the lowest rates to their quarterbacks. They had Tannehill, Mar like any of these mobile quarterbacks tend not to throw the ball to their running backs at a high rate because they like to run the ball more, which hurts. Last year, Brissett targeted the running back on 18% of his throws, which was not like bottom five, but the league average was 21%. And that three to four percent over, a, you know, a pass attempt number of like 500 is an extra 20 or so targets for the running back position, which is obviously huge in fantasy. Now, Rivers is on the other side of the spectrum. Last year, he targeted the running back at 32 percent of his passes. First in the NFL the year prior, 27 percent of his passes, which was I think only two teams had a higher rate throwing to their running backs than Rivers did and so on and so forth. We know that that's a big part of his game plan. It's a big part of their game plan. And that's how he's going to stay on the field and healthy, which is good overall. But does Taylor get that extra target load does he is he the one that's going to be more involved in the passing game i don't know they bring in michael Pittman, who they clearly said to you by the draft capital was more important to their offense than jonathan taylor was because they had two second round picks one very early in the second round took michael Pittman first and then jonathan taylor dropped to them nine picks later so you have ty hilton you have michael Pittman. they extended jack doyle you have naeem hines you have marlon mack you have jonathan taylor you have paris campbell coming back healthy so they have a lot of mediocre mouths to feed at least and we don't know what that means for jonathan taylor's target totals so my issue with taylor right out of the gate is that i don't necessarily see him hitting that volume total immediately his rookie year like at very worst marlon mack is like a 
an above average running back in the NFL, right? He's not great. He's not someone that you want to build your team around, obviously, but they trusted him enough to give him a big workload last year. And he's not going to just vanish off the face of the earth. I still think Marlon Mack gets six touches, six to seven touches a game. Is Taylor going to play right immediately over him? Yes, no doubt about it. Taylor's way, 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 way more talented, but Mack is still going to get somewhere in the five, six, seven touch range. Naeem Hines is still going to get his six, seven, eight touches per, per game, which he has averaged over the span of his career so far. So I think realistically, you're looking at a team that's going to want to run the ball a lot, but I think Taylor probably ends up his rookie year with closer to like 15 to 17 touches per game, which is good, right? It's still going to be in that like 240 to 260 range, but that's not really the touch total you want for your second round pick in fantasy drafts, right? You want a little more upside. His volume at Wisconsin was ridiculous, right? He was averaging 23.6 touches per game over the course of his career. Next year, 2021, all bets are fucking off. It's Taylor's backfield. Marlon Mack is a free agent after this year, and I wouldn't be surprised to start seeing Taylor get 22 to 25 touches per game going forward. This year, I I think we as a redraft community need to slow our roll with Jonathan Taylor because Mack is not disappearing. They have more weapons in the passing game. Naeem Hines is going to catch the majority of the passes out of the backfield. So with Taylor, you could see something like 240 carries and then maybe like 18 to 22 targets or some shit like that, which is, you know, great for your rookie year. But I wouldn't project that to be my second round fantasy football pick. And I think a lot of people are probably going to get really, 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 really hyped. But next year, he's all bets are off again, probably like the fucking third running back off the board. All right. So as we keep rolling down the list, you'll see that these are these are basically just running back after running back after running back because I think that they're going to be the most impactful during their rookie seasons. And we had a really, really strong class of running backs this year as compared to many years, at least to be able to project like a, a few years ago, like that Christian McCaffrey, Aaron Jones, Leonard, like that entire class was obviously very good. But a lot of the guys that ended up breaking out were kind of like later round picks. So it was a little tough to project this year. The top five running backs are the top five guys off the board. They were my top five running backs in the video I made two months ago. And it's Clyde, it's Jonathan Taylor, J.K. Dobbins, it's DeAndre Swift, Cam Akers, right? And they all ended up getting the draft capital. They all ended up in situations where they can excel for sure. I think the majority of them, though, are much better dynasty picks. You're going to be happier with them as dynasty picks than you are as rookie picks. So we have DeAndre Swift next up. And DeAndre Swift lands to the Detroit Lions. He was the second running back off the board. And this might have come as a surprise to a lot of you guys. I did say it a few times throughout like recent videos that I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if Detroit ended up you know, giving early capital to a running back. And they did so. Again, DeAndre Swift, second running back off the board. Jonathan Taylor, third running back off the board. These teams didn't see Jonathan Taylor as a three down guy. DeAndre Swift comes out of Georgia. I love DeAndre Swift. He was my RB1 pre NFL draft. Obviously he dips down a little bit. He's probably like third, fourth, maybe even to the, in that fifth range when it comes to rookie running backs, because the landing spot, just like I argued with Jonathan Taylor, seeing work get taken away from Marlon Mack, that's going to happen with carry on. DeAndre Swift doesn't go in there and start getting 20 to 22 touches a game. My problem with Swift and dynasty, I guess, is do we ever actually see that? Because Matt Patricia has shown that he wants to use a running back by committee. He was extremely hesitant to give carry on Johnson a full workload because he's scared about giving running backs too many touches and getting hurt. And that happened both times with carry on Johnson. So I highly, I mean, we, we had to watch, we had to wait eight, eight games, basically the first half of the rookie season for carry on Johnson to start being taken seriously by Matt Patricia. Do you remember that first half of the year for carry on Johnson? All we wanted to do was see him get the touch workload and LeGarrette Blunt just kept getting fed carry after carry after carry. He legitimately gave LeGarrette Blunt more touches over the first half of the season than carry on Johnson while LeGarrette Blunt was averaging two point fucking seven yards per carry. Like this is how stingy this is how fucking prideful and, and egotistical a guy like Matt Patricia is and he will continue to be that way with DeAndre Swift which is the problem for redraft because carry on is going to be very much involved I do think that that is this offense I mean you think about Patricia's first year in Detroit right Theo Riddick had something like 75 or 80 targets I think they're looking for another pass catching back if you look at their roster, they are very devoid of weapons outside of like Kenny Galladay. Like, yeah, Marvin Jones is there, but he's on the wrong side of 30 coming off injury after, you know, injury. After whatever. I don't see him being, you know, the guy that Marvin Jones once was. Outside of that, I mean, there's like Danny Amendola, Geronimo Allison, a bunch of nothings, really. TJ Hawkinson couldn't stay on the field last year. Tight ends take a long time to develop. So I think they're looking for a real pass catching back. Carry on is very capable in the passing game. He's actually pretty good, but I would argue DeAndre Swift is way, 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 way better. I'm probably on another level, and I, I assume that that's how they're going to use him. So I could see this back field being split up carry wise you know almost 50 50 but swift maybe flirting with that like 45 to 55 target total which will be good miles sanders had 179 carries last year 50 receptions 
Kenyon Drake had 170 carries last year, 50 receptions. So both almost the identical number of touches. Miles Sanders was the RB15 last year. Kenyon Drake was the RB16 last year. I, I think it's reasonable, maybe not reasonable, but as a almost a best case scenario for redraft, that is definitely in DeAndre Swift's range of outcome, something like 160 to 180 carries, which is 10 to 11 per game. Something happens to carry on who's proven that he cannot fucking stay on the, on the field. He cannot stay healthy. Then DeAndre Swift will obviously see a big uptick in in playing time because behind them i mean you think about the the depth chart that he went to right it's like ty johnson bo scarborough i don't even know who the fuck is left on the roster it's all a bunch of redundant guys who are plotters and now deandre swift gives this element of pass catching plus explosiveness and shiftiness to this backfield which they haven't really had in a while so while i love Karon johnson the player I think DeAndre Swift is in a whole nother class in terms of like a prospect and who he is as a talent. The problem with redraft is that he's going to be probably in a 50-50 committee for the majority of this season. Carry on is signed for two more years on his rookie contract. They can get rid of him at the end of this year, but it doesn't really make sense because he's not on a big contract, of course. He's still on that rookie contract. But I do think DeAndre Swift will have a little bit more upside than people probably will assume given the role that he's going to have right out of the gate, which is probably going to be a little bit of a slow one. I think his upside is top 15 running back, like with Sanders or Kenyon Drake. Most likely outcome is like somewhere in the 20 RB 20 to 22 range. So if you're drafting him, don't be drafting him as your RB2, planning on getting you know consistent, good, high-end RB2 production. I think you got to kind of temper expectations for a guy like DeAndre Swift because we also don't know what the fuck's going to happen on the goal line, right? Matt Patricia is a guy who he's got that mindset where he's like, I'm just going to give my biggest running back the ball on the goal line and see what happens with LeGarrette Blunt or whoever the fuck is back there, right? Because Swift is not the biggest guy. I think he's like 5'9", 212 pounds or something like that. So if he just, Matt Patricia continues to go at that philosophy and give the bigger guy, that pretty much qualifies anyone on that roster to get the goal line work. So I'd be surprised if Swift ended up scoring more than like four and a half or five I would put the over under maybe like four and a half or five and a half total for Vegas touchdowns on on his rookie season which is obviously going to be a big killer to his fantasy outlooks I do think there's real upside but I also think that expectations probably need to be tempered for a guy like DeAndre Swift at least in 2020 and that brings us to J.K. Dobbins who is in a class very similar to DeAndre Swift when we talk about redraft and I also should mention I think both of these guys are good picks if if they're I mean if they're like fourth round redraft picks I won't be trying to draft them anywhere really but if they start falling back to like the Kareem Hunt range. I think they're all in a similar range to in terms of outcomes where Kareem Hunt is, right? Because all, all three of these guys, J.K. Dobbins, DeAndre Swift, Kareem Hunt should have standalone value in fantasy, should be involved in the passing game and should see some good work on the on, on the ground. Not heavy volume, but good work on the ground. They have good standalone value, right? That you could probably play in flex, but also elite handcuff value, right? If Nick Chubb gets hurt, if Mark Ingram gets hurt, Carryon Johnson gets hurt, all of them immediately go into that borderline RB1, if not like top six, five, whatever fantasy running back ceiling. So you may have initially kind of thought that J.K. Dobbins' landing spot was bad, and it might be a little bit overrated for redraft, but for Dynasty, you actually, you have to absolutely love it. This is the most run-heavy offense in the league. I know a lot of that has been skewed because of Lamar Jackson taking a ton of rushing attempts, but they're also one of the highest scoring uh, teams in the NFL. The problem with J.K. Dobbins' redraft outlook for year one is that he's he's likely not going to get most of the valuable fantasy touches that we look for in our RB2 or flex spot or whatever, right? So with J.K. Dobbins, incredible prospect. I love him as a player. Love his long-term outlook. I think his ceiling is as high as any of the running backs that went into this class. But you look at touchdowns, you look at receptions. Lamar Jackson threw the ball to his running backs at a clip of 10%, the single lowest in the NFL. He does not throw to the running backs. He doesn't target the running backs. That's problem number one. Problem number two, Mark Ingram still there. Coming off of almost career highs last year. He scored 10 rushing touchdowns, five receiving touchdowns. They're not going to give the goal line work to J.K. Dobbins. There's no reason to. Mark Ingram was awesome on the goal line last year, regardless of what you want to see for fantasy. So just like Swift, I don't project Dobbins' touchdown total You know, per Vegas. I'll, when, when those eventually go up, I'll cover that again in a video. But I would project Dobbins to probably finish with around five, maybe six touchdowns on the year. And the fact that the overall volume for targets is really low scares me a little bit. And I've heard the argument from a few people now that, you know, if Gus Edwards can go for 700 rushing yards or 750 total yards, then how can, you know, J.K. Dobbins can go for a thousand this year. And I understand that, but you also have to understand that Gus Edwards racked up like 220 of those 700 total yards in week 16 and 17 when Mark Ingram was hurt. So if Mark Ingram was hurt, yeah, of course you like J.K. Dobbins, but you can't project any of these guys starting running backs to get hurt. But that being said, like, yeah, the, the Gus Edwards' production came when Ingram was out, then you wouldn't be looking at it the same way. So Dobbins, like, I really like him as a prospect. I think he brings a, an element of explosiveness to this offense that they've been missing from the running back position. 
Justice Hill, yeah, we all liked him as a prospect. Fourth round guy, Dobbins, second round guy, immediately takes over that RB2 role. Just adds another element of, of real explosion, real breakaway type runs, right? He had, I think, three or four 60 plus yard touchdown runs at Ohio State last year. Very much an element of his game. Very, very good in the passing game. But again, we don't know that type of volume is going to be there. We don't know if he's going to score any touchdowns, which makes me a little hesitant on him. But he is my RB3 in Dynasty behind Clyde Edwards and Jonathan Taylor. So I like J.K. Dobbins. I probably won't be drafting him unless he's going around that like Kareem Hunt range, which I don't think he's going to fall that low to. And then we have the final running back, which people are really, 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 really going to like, and that's Cam Akers. Cam Akers is... I think he's the toughest evaluation because I think in terms of like rookie running backs and ceiling, his ceiling is probably up there. I wouldn't be surprised if Cam Akers outscores Jonathan Taylor this year in redraft. So Akers goes to the Rams, second round, 52nd overall pick. And it's noteworthy because the Rams didn't have any first round picks. Cam Akers was their first player taken off the board. So that tells you they thought running back was their biggest need. They could have went with defensive players. They could have went with the fucking O-line, which could have served them pretty well right about now because their O-line is absolute trash. So Akers goes into a situation much like he spent his time with at Florida State with an awful offensive line. And the Rams, you know, just two years removed from being the, literally the top ranked offensive line last year dropped down to like 27th overall and like 28th in run blocking. So there are holes to be had there. Darrell Henderson is not competition for Cam Akers. Cam Akers comes in with workhorse size. Cam Akers comes in with an athletic ability almost on parallel to a lot of the running backs in the NFL. He has the ceiling of going straight into like an 18 plus plus touch workload. He can get that girly role. Very good in the passing game, super athletic, has breakaway speed, and do it all. The question becomes is like, is this Rams offense any good? Is this offensive line going to let him run for more than, you know, 3.9 yards per carry? Do they get on the goal line enough? Gurley was obviously great during his time there, but the holes he had were the size of the room that I'm sitting in right now. No defensive players for 20 feet at a time when Gurley was running through, and they were on the goal line like 17 times a game. That's not going to be the case with Cam Akers. But the volume will be there. And when we're looking at volume, that's what we try to project for redraft, right? And that's the things that we try to target when we're doing it. So I would probably take Cam Akers above DeAndre Swift and J.K. Dobbins for redraft in this first year because he has the clearest path to workhorse volume. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he started getting 20 touches a game as early as like week four or week five because he's by far and away the most talented guy on the roster. Again, the O-line is what scares me a little bit. So we've got Clyde, we've got JT. If I had to rank them right now for redraft, it would be Clyde. Akers and JT are really close to each other. I would probably take JT. Akers, Swift, and Dobbins are kind of interchangeable. I think I might take Swift over Dobbins in redraft, but Dynasty, I'd go Dobbins over Swift because I, long term, I think Swift might just end up in a running back by committee because he's under Patricia and Dobbins will be the RB1 behind Lamar Jackson for the next X number of years, which is fantastic. So we have those top five guys. In terms of redraft, guys, again, I know there are going to be a lot of running backs that you guys like, right? We have Keyshawn Vaughn in Tampa Bay. We have Antonio Gibson in Washington. With Gibson, I like Gibson as much as anyone does. He was my RB6 going into the draft. He moved to my RB7 in Dynasty. They have so many running backs on their roster in Washington. I mean, Darius Geist, they resigned Peterson. They they brought in a pass catching back in J.D. McKissick. They have Peyton Barber on the roster. They have Bryce Love on the roster. They have so many guys back there that there's no way Gibson is going to get that, you know, David Johnson type workload that we wanted to see out of him. I think it's it's much more likely that they use him as a wide receiver this first year, or at least like some kind of hybrid where he's getting more targets than he is carried. And that's not really what I want from Gibson, to be honest. He's not a good route runner whatsoever. He's just an amazing fucking athlete. They just need to use him as a running. I, 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 honestly, right now, as much as I love guys, I would just rather Gibson kind of get the keys to the backfield. I don't imagine him getting more than like you know, eight touches a game, maybe his rookie year. So I'm not, I'm not really going to be targeting Gibson in redraft outside of like very, very late in drafts. Keyshawn Vaughn is obviously interesting, right? We wanted someone to land in Tampa Bay. They didn't take any of the top running backs. Keyshawn Vaughn is a guy who's going to be extremely underrated in terms of like dynasty. I think he's de definitely worthy of a first round rookie pick, but uh, I think he, he probably goes into a running back by committee. I think like people, I think the ceiling for Keyshawn Vaughn is much lower than a lot of people probably think in year one. Because Ronald Jones, I mean, listen, Ronald Jones is younger than Keyshawn Vaughn. Ronald Jones has been in the NFL for two years. I know he hasn't been very good, but he was good enough last year to the point where I don't think you could just completely take him off the field. They are probably looking for a more well-rounded back because Ronald Jones is just fucking terrible in pass protection and Tom Brady's not going to stand for that shit. Vaughn is bigger and Vaughn is better in the passing game. Vaughn is better in pass blocking as well. So he definitely has a clear path to touches just because Ronald Jones is nothing special. But again, like what if we just see the Peyton Barber, Ronald Jones split last year, this year with Keyshawn Vaughn and Ronald Jones, where it's like one game, it's this guy, the next game, it's this guy, the next game, this guy gets 11 carries, four carries, one goal line touch here, one goal. Like that is my concern with it. So Vaughn, I like a lot more in Dynasty than I do in redraft. 
I, I think I saw him go off the board. I think I actually fucking took him off the board in like the sixth round of a best ball draft, which I don't know if I would even touch him there in, in redraft. I think he has probably running back by committee destined for him the first year as well, maybe with like an end of the year type breakout. But you can't draft guys hoping that they break out like weeks 11, 12, 13 and just stash them without being able to use them whatsoever on your roster. So those are probably the top running backs that I, I love Anthony McFarland as well in Dynasty. He'll be one of my most highly targeted running backs landing in Pittsburgh because James Conner can't stay on the field and the rest of the running backs in Pittsburgh are absolute trash. McFarland is so explosive and they haven't had that at the running back position. So McFarland's a very interesting stash as well. When we talk about wide receivers, okay, there was a lot of wide receivers that fell into spots that I think are interesting, even for year one of redraft. I will say this immediately. CD Lamb, if you think he landed in a bad situation, fucking just shame on you. Just shame on you as a football player. He landed in, in an offense that was the third highest paced offense last year, thanks to Kellen Moore. And now Mike McCarthy comes in who throws the ball at an extremely high rate with a very good quarterback in Dak, Dak Prescott, a good O-line. Like the offense is going to be fucking humming all year long. Yes, I understand that Michael Gallup and Amari Cooper are there. This offense is going to eat. I would expect CeeDee Lamb to play a lot of the slot. Randall Cobb just left. Randall Cobb's gone. Jason Witten's gone. And John Daigle over at Roto World is doing like an updated tracker. The available targets and air yard Cowboys, second most targets available in their offense. 190 targets have left this offseason. Second highest number in the NFL. So while you think all the targets are going to be vacuumed up by Cooper and Gallup, that's not the case. There, there are 190 targets left. Like Jarwin comes in as the every down tight end now and he'll get some targets. But like there is definitely more passing work to go around. And CeeDee Lamb is so explosive after the catch that if you put him in the slot and give him five targets a game, I don't I don't think 80 targets is out of reach for a 16 game season whatsoever for Lamb in his rookie year. He will make plays. He will be very, very good. And I wouldn't be surprised in a few weeks if he took over as the wide receiver too there. I think he's head and heels way better of a wide receiver than Michael Gallup is. And I think Midway through next year, we're going to see, not not this upcoming season, 2021, CeeDee Lamb is going to be competing with Amari Cooper for the wide receiver one role there. Do not pass on CeeDee Lamb in Dynasty rookie drafts because you think he landed in a, in a crowded fucking wide receiver group. Too many mouths to feed there. CeeDee Lamb will become the mouth to feed there. So do not pass up on CeeDee Lamb in rookie drafts. He's way too talented. Amari Cooper is not even guaranteed money after the 2021 season. CeeDee Lamb's good. The rest of the wide receivers that went off early, uh, Ruggs is not going to be a thing for redraft this year. They drafted Brian Edwards, Lynn Bowden, they already have Hunter Renfro, uh, Darren Waller, Tyrell Williams, and they don't have a good quarterback to throw to him. So I'm not looking at Ruggs in redraft. You had Jerry Judy, who was a very highly rated prospect. He goes to Denver. There's way too many. There's actually way too many mouths to feed, and they're not a prolific passing offense like Dallas, and they have Drew Locke and not Dak Prescott. So Judy, Judy's off my radar for redraft as well. Justin Jefferson is interesting, is definitely interesting. He goes to Minnesota. Uh, they get rid of Diggs, and Jefferson was a dynamite slot guy. I'm not sure how they plan to use him in this offense. He was very good at LSU on the outside in 2018. They switched him to the slot in 2019, thanks to Joe Brady's beautiful offense, and he dominated. But they, they run a lot of two tight end sets in Minnesota. That means that there are two wide receivers on the outside. Two wide receivers on the outside, two tight ends, and then one running back. So that means there will be no slot guy. Uh, Jefferson is much, 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 much better in the slot than he is outside. Do they use Thielen in the slot? Do they use Jefferson in the slot? Hard to say. So I think there's a, probably a little bit more risk, but he does have a high floor. If he does play the slot, then I think he could definitely make some noise in like PPR leagues for redraft this year. Probably not a guy that I'm necessarily targeting to, to have on the end of my bench in redraft. The one guy that does catch my eye for this year in particular is Denzel Mims. He was one of my favorite fucking prospects. And people are moving Mims so far down their board because they felt like he slipped in the draft. But the reason you feel that way is because we had a lot of wide receivers go before him. But he was he still a second round draft capital. That's that's perfect. Like I love second round draft capital for a wide receiver. Plenty, plenty draft capital. And he goes into a situation where they don't have a wide receiver one. They get rid of Robbie Anderson. He goes to the Panthers via free agency. And they have Jameson Crowder. Crowder's a slot guy. He's not a fucking alpha. Chris Herndon, I don't even know if Chris Herndon's ever gonna step on the fucking field. If nothing else, Mims is gonna step in right away as an every down player and see a, a ton of targets from Darnold. I love they got their left tackle, Makai Becton, gonna have a little bit more time to progress go through his reads not going to need to because Denzel Mims is wide receiver one so he'll be the first read uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Denzel Mims ends this year with 100 targets which is more than Stefan Diggs had last year so Mims is actually a guy that I might be looking at later in redraft leagues but otherwise like I don't typically look at wide receivers early or I don't typically draft wide receivers in redraft leagues because sometimes like last year we had a lot of them like break out per se there were a couple that did good over the uh, over the course of the entire year like a Terry McLaurin was an alpha very hard to project that 
most of them don't see a lot of playing time for the first eight to 10 weeks, right? We, we saw the chart in the last video I did where coaches just tend to not play rookies for whatever reason for a long period of their rookie season. I could see that being even more so the case because we're not going to have a real training camp probably. They're not going to be able to spend time together, the team, getting the offense down, getting the chemistry with the quarterback, yada, yada, yada. My intuition tells me that wide receivers this year are, are, are ones that you probably shouldn't be drafting in a redraft. End of year stats could look good, but owning AJ Brown for the first 10 or 11 weeks of the season, he was on and off your waiver wire, probably using a waiver spot trying to figure out or a roster spot trying to figure out when to play him. He was kind of a waste, right? So those guys might break out at the end of the year, but you could probably find them off your waiver wire. Are there any tight ends that I like? Absolutely not. Definitely not for a redraft. Quarterbacks, if you're in a super flex, I mean, Tua, we'll see what they do with Tua. We'll see how early he gets in the game. I'd imagine they probably start fits maybe for the beginning of the year and make sure that Tua's at full health and he's ready to go. I don't know if they want to shove him right into there. Joe Burrow, I'm extremely interested in Superflex as my second quarterback. I think he's got an extremely high floor, and I think that his rushing totals are going to be pretty fucking nice. Joe Burrow can easily pop off for like 300 rushing yards this year, which gives him like a nice weekly floor of like an extra two fantasy points. And he's got a fantastic arm, obviously, and they're equipping him with really good weapons. I didn't even talk about T. Higgins. They have T. Higgins. They have possibly A.J. Green coming back. I don't know if he's ever going to fucking step foot on the field again. Tyler Boyd is awesome. I think their tight ends are actually underrated between Drew Sample and C.J. Azuma. And they have two good pass catching backs in Gio and Joe Mixon coming out of the backfield. So Burrow is a guy that I'll definitely be targeting as my quarterback, too, if he drops to, you know, the quarterback 18 or 20 in drafts. He's got a fantastic floor just via passing plus his rushing upside. So I like Joe Burrow there for redraft this year. Yeah, I don't really like any other running backs. I think I think I touched on the top five. We touched on Keyshawn Vaughn, Antonio Gibson a little bit. And uh, we're working real, 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 real hard at the headquarters here between myself, Noah and Mike on the Big Dogs draft guide, which we've been updating wildly over the last couple of days. It's got all of the rookie outlooks. We have in-depth analysis on the outlooks. We have our, our full dynasty and rookie rankings for you guys tons of exclusive articles and videos tomorrow's video on youtube will be a first round rookie mock draft post nfl draft for dynasty and then rounds two three and four will also be doing but those will be in the draft guide as an exclusive video so make sure you go cop that right now at bigdogsdraftguide.com um, if you are eligible in states that play DraftKings or FanDuel. Um, we have partnered with monkey knife fight so you can get the draft guide at bigdogsdraftguide.com slash mkf m K F as in monkey knife fight, $10, $10 for the draft guide for both draft guides, dynasty rookie and season long. Plus you'll get $10, th that $10 that you deposited plus an extra $10 bonus to play with using promo code BDGE. When you sign up, you'll get access to both guides. I love y'all. That's it. Make sure if you enjoyed, you hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel. If you're new fantasy football all year round, keep your fucking tur tuck shirt, shirt, tuck, 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 t